I'm going to deepen those lines up for you. So let me show you what I've got for you. We've got a river coming in. We're looking from a satellite view or from an aerial view, which is from a, from a plane, down onto where a river meets the sea. Okay, so, and like I said, I, I realize that it's difficult for, to see. So here's my main shoreline here. That's going to kind of go off that way. And I'm kind of sketching with chalk here. And it's going to snake around, weave around, and then I've got sort of beach area here. And I've got lots of little creeks coming in here. There's lots of little, kind of looks like veins in the human body, little creeks coming in. And these are, these are fresh water, so slope is going this way, okay, from a higher slope down in, into sea level here. This is my main river channel. These are my saltwater flats. That's what that says there. And you, at any point, you can stop this video and zoom in. And we've got deeper water, gulf water out here. So this would be something like the Mississippi River, okay? Or any, any large river in the United States, it's gonna look something like this from, from space or from a, from a high airplane. Now, the reason I wanted to do it like this is because if you learn these different habitats separately, it may seem as if they're mutually exclusive. And what you'll find is that a lot of the same issues, they're not mutually exclusive, they're all happening in the same place at the same time. And a lot of the same issues that affect one affect others, okay? And if you lose one, you're gonna lose the others, and they're all connected. So let me, let me pull you a little forward here. And maybe you can see a little bit better. So let's start with this. Uh, what's coming down the river is sediment okay there's a there's flood there, it floods and then recedes floods and then recedes when it rains and you get a period of flooding you get a huge amount of sediment coming down and that's going to be deposited and that's our alluvium right so that we've got an alluvium deposit here and what's going to form first is our delta it's a very large land form of this alluvium soil this this uh clay and silt largely silt that is brought from somewhere up on the continent all over the United States brought down and deposited right here and so you've, you've got this sort of fan shape that's happening and that alluvium is out into the Gulf as well you've got that's why it says saltwater flats because there's a lot of this shallow water right right here that's, that's in the Gulf So this is sort of my delta region. Now, remember that's important for a couple of reasons. Uh, deltas are extremely productive in an agricultural sense, or really in, in, in terms of all plant life, because it's about the best rooting material that, that you can get, is alluvium. And also, uh, consequently, these places are uh, nearly always some place where mankind would have settled. And that's true of New Orleans, it's true of New York, it's true of Miami, it's true of, like, Loads and loads of places where there's a river meets the sea, that especially large rivers, that becomes a uh, place of commerce, a place of uh, great agriculture or trade. And a lot of our world's largest cities have built up right where a river meets the sea. London, for instance. Okay. And these coastal cities uh, tend to be in our our alluvial plain, our our delta that has formed. Now. Within that, probably the thing that you guys have been to, if you've been to a beach, you've been to the intertidal zone. So the intertidal zone is going to be all in here. I'm going to use blue for this. And the intertidal zone is the zone that where the tides affect, okay, where it's underwater at high tide and, and dry at low tide. And so that's going to be sort of this area here. And of course, that's going to go way on down the beach. And that's going to extend all the way down the beach that way. And extend down the beach this way. And it doesn't go all the way up the river. The tide does go up the river. 
salt water rises and it pushes salt water up the river a little bit. Not all the way up the Mississippi, but a decent way up. The intertidal zone is very important for all of our coastal birds and things like that. And tons of invertebrate species and things that live in the intertidal zone. It's extremely important for economics, beachgoers. People spend a lot of money to go to the beach, okay? And that's in hotel rooms, it's in rental cars, it's in flights, it's in eating out, it's, it's in food and beverage sales and the fishing sales, all of those things, all the things that people buy, surfboards and, and um, the, uh, parasailing and all those things. Uh, that all is in the intertidal zone. So it is, a, there is a, a, an ecosystem unto itself. It needs to be protected. It can erode. It can't, if it's not protected, then it just gets washed out to sea. So one of the main problems that we hear, like I said, when, when you, before in a previous video, when you think biomes, you need to be thinking about the problems that go with it, things associated with it. So this is an economic benefit and it is also at risk from shoreline erosion. Now, we've got several other things happening here, and uh, I'm going to go to this sort of uh, peach color here. One of the other things that happens when salt water is kind of coming in and going out, coming in and going out, coming in and going out with the tide, and then we've got fresh water coming in to varying degrees. It's always coming in a little bit or a lot of it based on how much it's rained, okay? So you have this area in here. Like so. Now I am drawing over a lot of my little, those little tiny creeks that are coming in. There are lots of little, little creeks coming in here of fresh water that's coming in from the delta. You have the huge river system and you have the, the micro system here, these little riparian zones and creeks. And these are extremely special ecosystems called estuaries. Okay, there's a, a ton of stuff going on. They're not static or stable. Like a desert is very, very stable. You know what's going to happen. Uh, there's a huge temperature swings during the day, but it's kind of always like that. Rainforest is the same thing. You know it's going to rain. You know it's always hot. It's never cold. It's very, very stable. This is not the case. Salinity, how much salt is in the water changes. The water level changes. How much turbidity and sediment is in the water changes. Could be clear, could be muddy. And that could change throughout in the day, in the 24-hour period. Of course, in the 24-hour period, the, the tides affect it. It is in a... It is in the inner, it's part of the intertidal zone, okay? Now, this is entirely salt, salt water back here. Over here, I've got small amounts of creek water. I've got the huge river water, the, the huge river system, and, the, and that has its own water quality. And I've got salt water coming up. So I have brackish or mixed water. is all together, all of those fluctuate constantly. And because of that, we have extremely high biodiversity. All estuaries are biodiversity hotspots 
and need to be protected. Let me say it again. All estuaries are extremely diverse. They're diversity hotspots and need to be protected. So we have high Diversity, and that's not just biodiversity. That's an abiotic diversity as well. The water quality is constantly changing. The everything about it, even where the water is, is constantly changing. So these are remarkably diverse habitats that change almost hourly. All right, I'm going to go over to sort of this yellow color here. In the rest of the delta, all in here, and we'll we'll go with uh, we've already cross hatched, so. I'll just go ahead and label. Coastal wetlands. Or what you might call marshland. Some people use the word swamp. This isn't actually a swamp, but there, there's a difference between a coastal wetland and a swamp. They, they're very, very, very similar. Um, you know, you, you could probably use the swamp here, coastal swamps, but marshlands or coastal wetlands is the more correct term and more likely the term you'll see on the test. And that occurs on the other side as well. Now you'll notice that there's creeks and stuff running through those coastal wetlands. That's really, really important. Part of it is that's how they become wetlands. And the other part of it is because the elevation is so low, and this is alluvium. Remember, it's spread by water. So these areas are super, super flat. They're, they're maybe a foot or less above sea level. They're flat as a pancake, and there's a bunch of fresh water rolling in. And so it spreads out and makes this wetland. And that's particularly important because the coastal wetlands have a very important ecosystem service and I'll talk about e ecosystem services in a minute but one of the main things that you'll see in coastal wetlands is that the coastal wetlands are a giant water filter all the water that reaches the estuary is supposed to be pre-filtered by the coastal wetlands that's what's naturally supposed to happen okay that you've got miles and miles and these are huge landforms You've got 15, 20 miles of giant natural water filter before that water reaches the estuary. That's what's supposed to happen. And so the, the water in an estuary should be really quite clean. That's what it's supposed to, is supposed to happen. When coastal wetlands get destroyed or disrupted somewhere, then, remember, like I said, all this stuff is connected. So the water coming into the estuary will either be flowing way too fast, not flowing at all, or totally not clean. And that's a serious problem for the estuary. And then when you lose the estuary, then all, all, all the entire ecosystem changes. Now, down here, you can't have coral reefs in this zone of deposition, okay? Remember, so we got a huge amount of sediment coming out of here, and this will have its own problem in a minute. But you, corals take thousands and thousands and thousands of years to develop, okay, the, the reef itself. And if it's constantly being covered over by sediment, then the coral is not able to form. That's its own can of worms because we can, mankind does influence how much sediment comes down. And so if mankind drastically increases the amount of sediment coming down the river more than it has been for the last 10 million years, then coral reefs can be damaged by sedimentation or siltation coming in and just literally covering, covering over the habitat that's supposed to be there. So out here in this deeper water is where we're typically going to get corals. Now we'll talk about coral reefs in a, in a little, in a, probably another video, because that's, that's a very, very specialized habitat. Sometimes you'll get corals growing all the way up close to the beach but usually they're, it, it, particularly at the mouth of a huge river, the corals can't exist right there in that, that zone of deposition. They have to be out in deeper water. And if you will do a little bit of research, you'll know that we have some deep water coral reefs in the Gulf of Mexico. They can't be right at Louisiana. They can't be right at New Orleans, but they're out in deeper water. And that's why. 
We're going to talk about ecosystem services of estuaries in a moment. Uh, I'm running out of room here, so I'm going to have to erase, and then I'll see you in a second. Okay, since we're going to, well, I erased some things, and we're going to talk about estuaries specifically. And I've got a T-chart here made of ecosystem services and economic services. Now, those are two different things. Economic has to do with money, and ecosystem services have to do with services to mankind that come from a functioning ecosystem. Let me say that again. Services to mankind that come from a functioning ecosystem. Okay, And uh, like I said about these coastal wetlands, they're a giant water filter. So that's what I'm talking about. Water filtration is a service of that ecosystem, which is not the same thing as natural capital. Natural capital is resources for mankind that are provided by nature. Coal, wood, right, for building materials, things like that. You know, any, any myriad of things that humans can use that is from nature, like food, right? So that would be natural capital. These are services, and so that's a different thing. Now, let me, let me run through ecosystem services real quick. Shelter habitat and nursery habitat. Many, many of our large open ocean species that you might find out here breed in estuaries. They lay their eggs or they have their pups in estuaries when they're tiny, tiny, tiny. You don't get out here and find tiny baby sharks. The baby sharks are in here. The baby, shark, baby sharks, baby snook, baby redfish, all those things breed sardines, all sorts of little things breed in these estuaries because it's nice, it's safe, there's nutrients coming in, but it's not too much of a good thing. The water quality is really, really good. It's very safe from the huge waves and everything. There's mangrove forests growing out that are stopping these waves. So these little fish can stay protected. They can hide from predators there. And thousands and thousands of, of crabs and seahorses and, and sharks and all sorts of things come to these estuaries to breed and to live out the first portion of their life cycle in these estuaries. So they're very, very diverse and they have a very, very high net productivity. There's, it's just full of life. Nursery areas, shelter habitat, shoreline protection. These areas, remember this is all highly erodible soil because it's all alluvium. So the mangrove forests, and you can stop and look up mangrove forests that are common in estuaries. The mangrove trees grow out well out into the water as the tides go down and everything else, the tides come back up. There's all this vegetation that has got its roots down in this alluvium that is stabilizing that shoreline. So all these creatures know exactly where that estuary is. They can come right back to it year after year after year for millennia after they've formed. So they protect the shoreline, make it very, very stable. And of course, biodiversity. We know that biodiversity is good because that's how the ecosystem is able to adjust to changes is if we have some biodiversity. If there's only one kind of fish out there and something doesn't go to suit that fish, something gets out of its zone of tolerance, and, you know, it's out completely. Biodiversity is better than less, more diversity is better than less diversity. And, and estuaries, functioning large giant estuaries really give us so much habitat to make that diversity happen. Now, economic services. This, is you, this one may surprise you. Commercial fishing. A lot of the commercial fish that you, you're going to, uh, or like shrimp, for instance, redfish, things like that, that are a commercial product that you go buy in the store, a lot of those fish start their life cycle in estuaries. So if you don't have any estuaries, within a few years, you don't have any fish, period. Recreation. Now, that includes recreational fishing. You wouldn't believe how much money people spend on fishing. Average, you can go, you can go put this to the test. You can go to Bass Pro Shops and look at uh, the bay boats. You know, the average bay boat's going to run you somewhere between forty and seventy thousand dollars. Now you could spend more than that even, but let's say you spend fifty grand on a boat. You know, then you got to have a truck to pull out. Well, that's seventy or eighty thousand dollars. Then you got to stay somewhere when you're down there, so you get a hotel room for a week, right? Well, you got to, you don't have a refrigerator full, so you're going to be eating out all the time, going to bars, this, that, and the other. Then let's say you want to do some skiing. Well, we got to get some skis. Well, we got to get some tow rope. We got to get all this other stuff. We got to get fuel. We got to get all these other other accoutrements that go with recreation, just to go fishing 
for a week, right? Or a few days or a weekend or whatever. And that doesn't include everybody that surfs, everybody that's going out and getting a tan, everybody that's going swimming, everybody that does whatever. Then all of those recreational dollars go to the economy. And so that creates jobs. If you lose the estuaries and you lose the beaches, why is there any reason for beach houses? Hotels. All the, the, the beachfront bars and restaurants and everything else and places where people dance and they buy things and shops and all that, all, it all, it's all gone if you lose the habitat because nobody's going to come see it, right? So this being beautiful, functioning, clean habitat is a large portion of how a lot of people have jobs. No, harbors, okay? Uh, a lot of people gravitate and always have humans gravitate to these areas because they're safer than just parking your boat on a beach someplace you're going to come in here and, and find a, a safe little bay in here to to park your boat and it's been that way since the advent of the boat back when the vikings are paddling about they're not gonna they're gonna look for a safe harbor so these places are intimately connected with the very roots of mankind. 